Dale. Good afternoon, brethren. Brethren, this is a happy day. This is a special event because it is a fulfillment of a decision by God, the Father, our Father, to do something special for His children as first fruits. And so today, brethren, we want to take a look at the awesomeness of being a first fruit. Now the concept of first fruits was introduced to Israel. And let's take a look at a few scriptures here that mention this. Let us look at Exodus chapter 34. And let us look at verse 19. He says, all that opens the matrix or the womb is mine. And note that, that phrase for me. All that opens the matrix is mine. And every first sin among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. And let us drop down to verse 22. It says, And you shall observe the feast of weeks, which is today. As we've heard, uh, today is mentioned by several names. It's mentioned as Pentecost. Mentioned the feast of weeks. Mentioned also as the feast of harvest. Feast of first fruits. So verse 22 says, Thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then it says that the feast of ingathering, the feast of tabernacles is year end. Now let us go to Numbers chapter 3. Numbers chapter 3. And let us look. Uh, of verse 12. See where God puts emphasis on this again. From verse 12 it says, And I, behold, I have taken from the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of all the firstborn that opens the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine. Verse 13. Because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn of Egypt in the land of firstborn of the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast. Mine they shall be. I am the Lord. So here God is establishing that the firstborn or the first fruits are mine. And he separated the Levites from them. They are mine. Let us look in the New Testament to see where we find some parallels with, with this statement from there. Let us go to Revelation chapter 14. End of the Bible now. So we, we see how far it extends. Revelation chapter 14. And let's start from verse, and let's look at verse 4. It says, uh, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the mount of Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. No, hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name. The lamb is Christ, and this group of people have the father's name written in their foreheads. And drop down to verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, meaning false religions, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Note again, brethren, the first fruits redeemed specially. And let us go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I think Mr. Myers had made a reference to that yesterday. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let us look, let us start from verse 23.
Paul is writing here, he says, uh, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, again, no first fruits, but the first of the first fruits, and afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. And then he goes into, you can read the rest of it, but the point I want to make, he establishes here that Christ as the first fruits, and after Christ, they that are his at his coming. Now he was referring here to a ceremony that took place in the Old Testament. And if we go back to Leviticus chapter 23, we can see uh, Leviticus chapter 23, and let's go from read from verse 10. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I gave unto you, you sh and shall reap the harvest thereof, then shall you bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the Lord. And he, the priest, shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf, and he lamb without blemish, of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Uh, and let's drop down to verse 17. And you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deeds. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now what is happening here? Before the, Israeli, the Israelites were allowed to reap of their crops, the priests would get a selection, a sampling from various places of a sheaf, one sheaf, the first fruit. And they would bring that to the high priest. And then he would choose from among this one and wave it before the Lord. They say actually what he would do, he would raise it like this, approach the altar, and then regress. And that was considered the waving. Now that sheaf represented Christ, who was the firstborn, the first human being from the dead to obtain eternal life. Now, that ceremony had to be performed before Israel was allowed to reap the harvest and do anything with it. That was the first thing that had to be done. Now, after the sheaf was offered, there were a lot of other sheaves left behind because they were brought from different things as the first fruit. But you remember, Christ is the first of the first fruits. So the one that was offered up to the Lord represented Christ. And notice, nothing was done with it. You had to take it offer it and that was it but then at verse 23 says now on this day Pentecost they had to bring two wave loaves of two tenths deals and they had to bake the loaves with leaven why leaven because the rest of the thieves that were left back represents us but we have sinned both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They said the two loads represented the Old Testament uh, Christians and the New Testament. Both of, all of us have sins. So they were baked with leaven. And then they had to wave them before the Lord. And he says what? They are the first fruits unto the Lord. So now, brethren, why is this feast? also referred to as first feast, as the feast of the first fruits why not simply pentecost or the feast of the harvest christ is called the first of the first fruits and after the high priest engaged in waving these uh two two loaves before the lord god called them first fruits What is the significance of it to be in first place? Is it a coincidence, brethren, that we 
I call first fruits. So what is God doing? God is naming a feast after us who are also called first fruits. And he is saying that this is a feast of the first fruits. Do we see something special there, brethren? Do we see God honoring us by the ceremony that he has entrenched to be part of his plan? We will see a little bit more. As I said, the laws represented Christians in both the Old and New Testament because we have sin. But God calls them his first fruits. They may or may not have been made from the, the first fruit of the grain that had been left over. We're not sure on that. But God called them his first fruits. And look how he established the ceremony. Because Pentecost is also called the feast of the first fruits. So what God is doing is honoring us by establishing this feast. And let's go and see a, a statement that Paul made when he was, in a sense, music on the significance of human beings. Let us turn to Hebrews chapter 2. And let's go from verse 5. He says, for unto the angels, has he not put into subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. So Paul starts off here by letting us know that something special is happening here. That in the world to come, it is not going to be put into subjection to angels. Why? He says, but one in a certain place. And he's being, I think, a bit deferential here. Because what he's about to quote is a psalm by, Dave, by David. But Paul apparently doesn't want to make it appear he's uh, attempting to contradict or to uh, reinterpret David. So he says, one in a certain place. I mean, he knows where it's from. One in a certain place testify, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that you visit him. You made him a little lower than the angels. Some translations say for a little while, lower than the angels. You crowned him with honor, with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. You have put all things, all things, brethren, in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we don't yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, or in other words like us, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons, note, many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And you can read the rest of it. But the point that Paul is making here, going back to verse 5, he has not put in subjection the world to come to angels. But who has he put it to? As he says in verse 8, you have put all things under his feet, meaning man. For in that he put all in subjection under his feet, he left nothing that is not yet put, that is not put under him. So what is, what is Paul revealing here, brother? Is how special man is to God. And as he said here, in verse 7, you crowned him with glory and honor. Brethren, is it honor that God would dedicate a celebration to the first fruits? 
We are the first fruits. Is that not a reason to be excited, brother? I certainly am, you know. I mean, if we had music, I would dance, you know. I would do like David did. This, this, I mean, brethren, yesterday, after I prayed the opening prayer, it's like a vista was open to me. I couldn't believe this. I couldn't contain myself. This is a fulfillment this day, brethren, of what Paul has said. Thou crown him with honor. It is an honor for God to name a feast after the first fruits. Why first fruits is mentioned with the feast? And so, brethren, what we are seeing here today and on this day, Pentecost, is this fulfillment of this intent of God to crown us with honor and glory. Another scripture says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world doesn't regard us as something special, but God does. Because the world doesn't regard the Father as something special. You know, I was looking at a, 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 a film on, on, on YouTube the other night, and a, a guy who's a, an astronomer, just the idea, he said to the extent that, I mean, we talk about the ice being that great and stuff, but I mean, we have animals who have better vision than we. They can perceive things we can't. Eagles can see this. Our snakes can see with, with ultraviolet. So, I mean, <coughs> brother, I had to go through an eye surgery not too long ago. And I can tell you that what this guy was saying is an attempt to diminish and belittle. What, what, what God is capable of. The fact that we can't see anything with true ultraviolet spectrum in no way diminishes uh, our eyesight capabilities. And so, brethren, this is a day that we have a reason to be happy and to rejoice. And, you know, I don't know how else we can express that. Because this day, brethren, we're seeing a fulfillment of what Paul has said here. That what is, I mean, let me read the scripture again, brethren. It fills me with excitement. You know, one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? You made him a little while lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor. And brethren, this feast of Pentecost, this feast of first fruit, this feast of harvest, is God's way of crowning us with glory and honor. And I think it is a reason for excitement. Brother. And we see that the Feast of the Fruits too, there is an awesomeness to it. And I think, brethren, this is something that should excite all of us.